Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Partick Trinity and to our Sunday morning service of worship. And a particular welcome if you're new here, if you're a visitor, and also a welcome to those who might be joining us from home or wherever you find yourself uh, watching the live stream. Now, the best way to have a handle on what is going on in the life of our church is to subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. And there's a link to do that on our website at partictrinity.org.uk. And uh, we're also occasionally going to produce hard copy newsletters. And uh, we have some available at the door. So if you missed that when you came in, uh, hopefully you can pick up on that on the way out and have a sense of what's going on. Um, some of our church family news and things where we were looking for help and people to become involved. And one of those particular areas that I've been flagging up over recent weeks is to do with our creche. Now, we have a, a, a wonderful group of preschoolers uh, who are a lot of fun, uh, but the team that have been looking after them for the last year or so is being stretched. Some people are having to step down for a while, and we'd love others uh, to step up. And the information, again, it's in the newsletter. It's also currently on the screen if you'd be interested in finding out more or would like to volunteer to help with creche. I'm conscious that Sundays come around very quickly and a lot can happen uh, in just a week. I mean, I can think of in the last seven days, there was a moment where I was standing in Victoria Park, uh, the sun was shining uh, and I was watching uh, my oldest son ride a bike without stabilizers for the first time and thought, life is good. But I've also, in the same week, you know, found myself standing at a gravesite twice, in fact, in a week. People gathered there to mourn. And I know that for you, whoever you are, you'll be coming here this Sunday, having had seven days worth of life, uh, things that have been hard, things that have been easy, things that have been good, things that may have felt painful uh, and sad. But on a Sunday, it's our privilege to come together like this. Uh, we, we trust that we've been brought together by God in order to meet with God and worship God together. So let me read these words from Psalm 27. And then we're going to stand and we're going to uh, sing together, praising God, singing, Better is one day in your house. So these words, the psalmist says this, One thing I seek, ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Let's stand and praise God.
ourselves pushed towards you by our needs, drawn closer by your promise, called by your spirit, we come to you in prayer as we are with all that we bring with us and we come to worship you. All at once we are daunted by your greatness, by the sheer otherness of your character and yet you make us secure in your love. We come with nothing to offer you except what we've received from you. And yet you welcome us. We know that we blow hot and cold. And yet you are always the same. Always faithful, always true. From beginning to the end. And so we thank you for your patience and for your every kindness towards us. And we praise you because of your love shown to us in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who does for us what none of us could have done and who makes it possible for us to know you and to come into your presence and to experience your love all that we have comes from your hand and we depend upon you completely for all that we need. You are our help, you are our strength. And so we ask that you would help us. Help us to think less about ourselves and about what others might be thinking about us and to think more about who you are and to trust you. Help us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Help us to pray and help us to keep praying. Help us to use what you've given to us to give you glory. Help us to keep going especially on the days when just keeping going feels like a stretch. Help us to bear with one another in love. Help us to trust when our instinct is to take control. Help us to be ready for all that you might ask of us. And help us to rejoice 
and to rejoice in every circumstance. Lord, we long to meet with you. We come to seek your face. Help each one of us to listen to your voice. We don't struggle to find distractions. All the things that clamor and demand our time, our attention now. Instead, we ask that you would give us the spirit of the boy Samuel, who said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And we are thankful that you listen to our prayers. And we ask that you would hear us now as we pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to praise God as we sing once more, How Great Thou Art.
take a seat. Now, over the last few Sundays, we've been on a, a journey with Jesus. We've been joining him with his closest friends and followers on the road. And there's been a whole series of accidental encounters, unplanned conversations, where we find Jesus talking to real people, some his friends, some strangers, some in need, some skeptical. And as we eavesdrop on those conversations, we find ourselves learning more and more about this man, Jesus, and what he offers us, and what he asks from us. And today, as we continue our readings, we've reached a a, a pit stop on the road, an account of a meal, where there's people coming together with food and Jesus at the heart of things. And so we're at Luke chapter 14, reading verses 1 to 14. And Mirai is going to come and read the passage for us. Thank you, Mirai. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, He told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Thank you, Mira. You read that beautifully for us. And now let's pray before we consider those uh, verses together. God, our Father, sometimes when we're watching the news, we're reminded that what we are doing here today to some people would seem an impossible privilege. Whether it's through the chaos of war or living in a situation or under a regime where there simply is no freedom, the thought of meeting together, having time with friends, the chance to meet new people and together to read and listen to the Bible and respond to you in singing and in prayer. And so we thank you that we can do all of those things. And we also remember those who are close to us who are struggling right now, where poor health or loss of confidence or complicated circumstances mean that it simply isn't possible or it wouldn't be wise for them to come into a church service like this. We ask that you would draw close to them so that they would know that they are not invisible and they are not forgotten. And we thank you for the children in creche and all their helpers and our young people in blast upstairs. And our prayer for them is the same as our prayer for ourselves that through the things we do together today, we might know you better. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A 
unless you're a, an unusual sort of person, uh, it's not nice to feel that you're under scrutiny, uh, to have that sense that what you're saying or what you're not saying or what you're doing or not doing is being closely observed and subject to some sort of evaluation or scoring system. And that's partly why job interviews are so draining and exhausting, however well or badly they go. The same often you know, for, a, for a first date or any number of other situations where you sense the impression I'm making right now is really important. And where there's the possibility, on the other hand, that you might well be rejected, that you might not make the grade. And that feels close and immediate. Now, Jesus, as we've seen, as we'll continue to see, as he encountered different people, he always made a very powerful impression. And, and sometimes what that provoked was anger or resentment or suspicion. And other times there was an immediate sense of loyalty to Jesus or devotion. It all came to the surface very quickly. Emotions and responses to who he was as he fell under their scrutiny. And for his part, Jesus was always paying attention to those people that he met on the road. He seemed to tune in very quickly to what was on their mind, their anxieties, their hang-ups, their hopes. And he would hear the questions that they would verbalize out loud, but often perceive the, the real question that lay under the surface of that question. A sense of the, the, the sort of tangle of uh, hopes, fears, longings that, that form any personality. And in the reading that we heard, Jesus is invited to pause on his journey and to eat in the home of a prominent Pharisee. And it's clear from what Luke tells us that he was being carefully watched. Jesus was under particular scrutiny throughout this encounter. He was being examined, his, he was being interrogated. Now, of course, by inviting him in the first place, they give the impression that what they want to do with Jesus is uh, include him. You know, come into my home, eat from my table. But it's not an unconditional welcome. And we get the sense that perhaps the, the judgment uh, that is there to be proved or dispelled is that Jesus is a problem. That Jesus should be under suspicion. So the sense is, come for dinner, make yourself at home, but don't make yourself too comfortable. But before they even get to the table, Jesus' attention is given over to someone who would never have been invited to a gathering like that. Someone whose default position was to always be on the outside, to be excluded, untouchable, a man in a sorry condition, suffering from abnormal swellings, his, his body retaining fluids, an obvious outward sign, almost certainly of some other condition or disease. And so we have this coming together at the beginning of our passage where there is Jesus who is being uh, closely watched by these critical observers and there is this suffering man. And in some ways it feels like a, a setup, you know, a moment where Jesus is going to be seen to react on the spot without warning and might well reveal his true colors. Because Jesus already had a reputation for being or lacking care and discernment with who he spent time with, who he was willing to eat with. So what would he do now? What would he do now in the presence of this man on a Sabbath day? And let's say a bit more about those observers and the significance of that day. We've said the observers were, were, were Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were really a, a movement within the, the wider Jewish population. And we, we only know so much about them, although they pop up quite frequently in the biblical accounts of Jesus's life. But the evidence we have gives us an impression of a, a movement of people who were acutely conscious that everything that was precious to them as Jews, as the people of God, was being threatened both by oppression from outside, people who just came in, didn't care about what they cared about, and were willing to be careless with what was precious to them, but also from compromise within. 
people who were willing to let go of what the Pharisees desperately wanted to hold on to. So they were people who took Scripture, the Bible, very seriously, reading it, teaching it, applying God's Word carefully, rigorously to the whole of life. And they wanted others to come on board, to embrace what they had embraced and to exclude the things that they felt necessary to exclude. And not least in all of this, taking seriously what God's law had to say was taking seriously what God's law had to say about the Sabbath. That Sabbath day, that one day in seven that was part of the rhythm of life, something that was given by God. It was there in the Ten Commandments. If we go back to Exodus 20, we remember we have Moses there receiving from God this law for his people. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, your son, your daughter, your male, female servants, your animals, or any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Sabbath takes time and makes it holy. It says, look, one day in seven is different. It is set apart. It is from God. It is for us to be with God. A day away from work. A day when we are liberated, set free to rest and meet with God. And so the the Pharisees and the experts of the law who end up at this dinner party were people who had very strong views about the Sabbath. They wanted to take it seriously. They wanted it kept. And they weren't shy about calling out those who would compromise on what it meant to keep the Sabbath. But what else might they be willing to compromise on? And so they are carefully watching Jesus on this Sabbath day. And I suppose they're wondering whether he's going to hold the hard line that they've adopted Would Jesus reveal that, in fact, instead of being part of the solution, he was part of the problem? Now, Jesus is there. He knows what's going on. He knows what day of the week it is. He knows and cares about the Sabbath. And Jesus is conscious. It's not nice, that feeling of being stared at, is it? Jesus is not oblivious to their gaze boring into them. And he knows the unvoiced questions that are behind those staring eyes. And so it's Jesus who breaks the silence by posing a question of his, of his own. And it was exactly the kind of question that they were usually asking of others, the kind of question that asks you to, to draw a line, a boundary that shouldn't be crossed. Jesus says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they don't answer. They're always talking about what's lawful or not, but they don't answer. They remain silent. And Jesus just allows that silence to linger, and then he acts. And without waiting for the Sabbath to pass, Jesus embraces this excluded man. And in taking hold of him, Jesus heals him. We're not given much more explanation. We're just given the brute fact. It's a miracle. It's instant. But there is this obvious, completely unambiguous change in the man's condition. And then Jesus just sends him on his way. You know, he's free from the condition. He's free from what must have been a very uncomfortable situation as Jesus' question hung in the air and nobody else said anything. And then Jesus asks another question. And here he is speaking into the Pharisees' world of the ins and outs of God's law for every circumstance. He says, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, Will you not immediately pull it out? Of course, these are rhetorical questions. The answers are self-evident. There are situations where whatever day it is, you simply do what you have to do. You don't consider it work in the conventional sense. You're not acting contrary to the purpose of the Sabbath. And once more, they have nothing to say. So they've accused Jesus with their eyes. But do they hold themselves to the standards that they would set Jesus or set others? And so by just putting the question out there, 
and seeing it fall to the ground unanswered, their instinct to find fault is exposed. Because what Jesus has done, this amazing miracle, may contravene some code or decision about what constitutes work or not, but what he does is no way contrary to the purpose of God's Sabbath. You know, Sabbath, you know, the reading of Exodus reminds us, you know, Sabbath is the, it's the culmination, it's the end point of God's good creation. And so on this Sabbath day, this day of rest, Jesus brings rest to that suffering man. So on a day that is from God, blessed by God, for God and humanity to enjoy together, we see God's Son embracing that excluded man and bringing to him both healing and blessing. And what we see in that little scene is an expression, I suppose, of the freedom of God's grace. In a sense, it's not deterred by the starting point or the expectations of the audience watching on. You know, each one of us, me included, you know, we, we carry about with us any number of prejudices. In fact, sometimes it's against ourselves. We just assume that we are the ones that will never be quite right or on the inside. And yet Jesus shows here what he will show at every point along the road, that he is someone who will embrace the excluded. He will sit and eat with anyone and everyone, lovable or not. And then we come to the dinner itself. And into the house we go, and there are no more miracles here. But there's plenty of talk around the table. And these themes of exclusion and embrace, they're not left outside. And again, Jesus is paying attention to what's going on. And all these guests, these important people in the house of this prominent Pharisee, find themselves very eager to secure for themselves the best seats. You know, so there's, must have been obvious, the place of honor, the place to be, the place you want to be seen, the place where it happens, with all the implied kudos that goes with that. And yet, as Jesus watches them, there's nothing especially honorable about their behavior as they jostle one another. You know, it's very different to be welcomed and for someone to go out of their way to, to honor you, to treat you as special, to extend hospitality in all its fullness as a gift. It's another thing to try and sort of wheedle your way in and demand it for yourself. And so without commenting on this scene directly, Jesus begins in a sort of, I suppose, a sort of teacher mode to share some wisdom, share some pointers of how you ought to choose your seat in a social situation. And it's a very thinly veiled commentary on what's happening right in front of him and in their midst. And so Jesus begins, he's, he's really telling a, a parable, he's setting a story, drawing upon familiar things. And this time it's a, it's a wedding feast. So just picture it, public occasion, special occasion. You are there, you are a guest, and where is your place going to be? And make no mistake, not all the seats are equal. You know, this uh, reminded me of uh, one of these great moments in family life when I was at one of my cousin's wedding. And I was, I was about 22, and through some tampering with the table plan by one or perhaps more of my younger sisters, I ended up sat not with uh, you know, my older sister and my brother-in-law, but at the kids' table, which came with slightly smaller furniture. And I was as far as you could possibly be from the top table. You know, I was almost with the catering staff in the kitchen. And of course, that was not the place I wanted to be. It was not the place I wanted to be seen. And in a public situation, you know, whether it's obvious or signposted or not, we, we know where the, the kind of business class and economy class seats are. We know who are the top guests. And in his parable, Jesus really plays out two scenarios or two approaches to this situation. In the first, you aim high. You go for the best possible seat, the place of honor. But what happens next is a little unfortunate and embarrassing. You know, whatever other qualities you may have, that seat was actually intended for someone else. 
And the guest, the host, is not embarrassed to, to say so. You know, excuse me, that seat is for someone else. And then with no little embarrassment and humiliation, you find yourselves unseated in front of everyone else who has already found their seats. And you find yourself traipsing back to the table plan to find the one seat that has been left until last. You know, you're stuck there at the kids' table at the edge of things. Then Jesus rewinds it. He says, well, second scenario. Imagine you walk in there and you allow for a moment that there might be someone, maybe just one person who is more worthy than you of the top table and the best seats. So in fact, you go to the opposite extreme. You, you, you head straight for the spare seat stuck at the end of the kids' table. And the host notices. This didn't happen to me, unfortunately. And in front of everyone else, they say, well, this isn't right. You're not a kid. You're our special honored guest. Come and join us right at the heart of things at the top table. You know, by taking the humble place, they are lifted exactly where they would want to be. And there is Jesus telling this parable, and he's in this room full of invited guests, people who were important, who rarely would have reason to feel excluded from anything. And yet amongst themselves, they're fighting for attention and honor really attempting to honor themselves, wanting to be in the place where everyone is looking at them, where no one would dare look down on them, where that fear of missing out is just buried through their own action, where they might be honored, where they might be embraced. And this is all happening, of course, on the Sabbath day, which was the day where they're to rest, where they're to receive what God has given. And instead, they're actually working very hard to get themselves where they want to be without realizing at the same time they're pushing it out of reach. And I remember sometimes, and I've seen this as an adult with other young children, but I even remember it as a child, sometimes a teacher would say something like this. They'll say, right, I'm going to pick the person or the group who are sitting quietest. And if you do this with very young children, you get this strange tension where they, they try to draw attention to how quietly they are sitting. So they'll be, they're sort of wriggling and like almost picking their nose with their finger in front of their mouth. And they're sort of silently screaming at the teacher to pick them first. And then sometimes it's just too much. They burst. They say, pick us. We're being quiet. They shout it across the classroom. And they put everything into reverse that they've been working towards. Jesus says to these squabbling important people, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, most of us would struggle to live like that could be true because our desire to be included, to be embraced, we might not use the word exalted, but, but to be taken seriously and respected drives us to do whatever we think will help us to get to that point. You know, it's flattering to feel that you are included that you are in the inner circle, the core group, to be on the inside looking out. You know, these Pharisees, they, they took that posture of being on the inside looking out in relation to the suffering man. In fact, they took that posture in relation to Jesus himself. But actually, when they all come together in one room, they find themselves scrabbling because inside that circle, there is a, an even tighter circle that they want to be part of. They want to be on the right side of the line. And I expect it was exhausting. And for what? Jesus' warning is that those who exalt themselves, like the person who take the walk of shame from the top table down to the bottom table, that they will be humbled. And his surprising promise is that those who go the other way and humble themselves will be exalted. And it's so counterintuitive that we're tempted to hear this and just dismiss it. You know, it sounds worthy, but surely it's nonsense. You know, when you humble yourselves, others just take advantage. They walk all over you. You need to make things happen for yourself. You need to build a, a following. But it's not nonsense. It's wisdom. And there is a wisdom in humility. And it's a wisdom that we see applied and lived out in Jesus' own life and experience. It's not just what he says, it's what he does. 
Jesus gives himself so completely to serving God and serving others that he doesn't stop when it costs him. He embraces who he is called to be, even when it leads to his own exclusion. And so we end up at the cross, you know, what could be this full final rejection. And yet what Jesus then experiences in the resurrection to new life is complete vindication. You know, he takes the lowest place and is lifted to the highest place. And we're called to live as Jesus lived. And it might not look so dramatic. We're invited actually to live it out on the the plane of our ordinary human relationships, which includes, amongst other things, weddings, dinner parties, hospitality. And in the light of Jesus, we're, we're called to have a whole new attitude to how we engage in those times together. As those who are uh, loved by God, who have been embraced by Jesus, we are to embrace others, whether or not they have anything to offer us or any claim upon our generosity. I'm not sure how this would go down over dinner, but Jesus then speaks to the host. He's not talking in parables anymore. He's talking to the, the actual host of the actual dinner that they're sharing in together. He puts it in very stark terms. He says, when you give a lunch or a dinner, Don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors. Why not? Because if you do, they might invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. Jesus sees right through the power plays and the networking, you know, hospitality that's really an investment that we expect to pay back in time. Instead, he sets before his host a far more demanding vision of what hospitality is and can be. He says, when you give a banquet, when you're really trying to do something special for others, who should you invite? Well, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. And don't, don't think for a second that the, the suffering man outside had been forgotten at this point. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. American scholar David Jeffrey Lyle writes a commentary on this passage and says this. He says, hospitality in the light of Christ is not part of social obligation or reciprocity. Rather, it is like our very forgiveness, part of our identification with his love for the unlovely and those who can never hope socially to reciprocate. See, Jesus wants the host to see that true hospitality is costly. It's a love for the unlovely. It's an intentional self-giving. It is work that allows others to rest. And there is no Sabbath rest without six days of work. And Jesus does not ask of him or anyone else what he would not be willing to do himself. He's already embraced the excluded before their eyes. He will willingly go out of his way to eat, spend time, touch, hold, embrace those right at the margins, those who are despised. Accepting their invitation, whoever they are, encouraging an invitation, even when it's not forthcoming. Now, what could Jesus get from that suffering man? He wasn't useful to Jesus. He was not good PR. He was not someone who would open doors. In fact, he might have closed some. But there is a complete freedom to the grace of God that we see in Jesus Christ that is always willing to reach beyond and embrace, that tears down, that exposes, that embarrasses the things that we do to exclude. This provokes some very hard questions which I'm going to ask and then make no attempt whatsoever to answer and just for us to think about. And at this point, it might be good if someone just gave crash and blast a warning to come back in. So let's think about ourselves, our own lives, our life together as a church family. Now, who is it that we exclude or leave out? Is there a a filter that we apply to certain types of people. Well, they are really not church people or they're not really our kind of people. 
or they are too hard work? Or another question, who might it be that we, who, 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 who could we welcome that actually might never have the experience of feeling welcome anywhere, ever? What might it cost us as a church to embrace those who feel excluded from it? What might we have to let go of? And finally, and this is, a, this is one that I struggle with, d- does Jesus mean what he says when he says those who humble themselves will be exalted? And if he does mean what he says, why do we find it so difficult to take it seriously? We're going to sing in a moment, and in the words of the song we sing, Oh, how good it is, in one of the verses it says, Oh, how good it is to embrace his command, to prefer one another, forgive as he forgives. And I hope perhaps that you've had a taste of that goodness within a church, if not this church, then another church, that welcome and embrace as we respond to all that God has given and done for us. But let's now sing that song together. Oh, how good it is. Oh, I dropped my pen.
see. No, a big whelp. It's up in blast upstairs and it's come down. And everyone who was through in the crash, you've come in here. Now, we've just been singing a song about actually how good it is to be together. So it was good that you came uh, into this room so that we could all be together as we sang that together. Now, there are some, some things, things that are good some of the time, but not all of the time. I don't know if you know the kind of thing uh, that I mean. Now, on a really hot day, when you're on holiday and the sun is beating down and you're lying there, a cold swimming pool is a beautiful thing, isn't it? It is good to jump into that cold water and feel it wash over you. But if it's a cold day, if the wind is blowing and you're on one of my holidays, it is not a good thing to jump into that cold swimming pool. You change color. You feel strange and peculiar, and you'll shake for about two hours afterwards. Chips, I love chips. Who doesn't love chips? There's a couple of people who don't love chips. There's one in my family, actually. Hi, Harris. Um, but chips are great. I love chips, nice salty chips. But you know, if you've just been on a run, and you're hot, and you're sweaty, and you're thirsty, salty chips just don't cut it. There are some things that are good some of the time, but aren't good all the time. In fact, there's lots of things that change all the time, like the weather. There's good weather, there's bad weather. Ourselves, sometimes we wake up in the morning and we feel good. And some mornings you wake up, and you've got a cough, you've got a temperature, and you feel bad. It goes up, down, and sideways. But one of the things that we hold on to together is that God is good. God is always good. God is good all the time, whether we're having a good day or a bad day, whether we're on holiday or at school or at nursery or at home or stuck listening to the minister in church. Whatever is going on, God is good because God's love endures forever. It never stops. It doesn't pause for a break. It never gets old. God's love endures forever. And we're going to sing a song together. And part of the fun of this song, so everyone stand up right now. Um, we might need a bit of help to get used to this one. But in this song, there are different parts where it'll say on the, on the screen uh, that there's going to be a leader, and then we're going to be invited to sing it together. Our musicians are going to help us. But the song is all about God's goodness and his love that goes on forever. So I'll stop talking and I'll hand over to the people over here. We're going to sing the first verse twice, so just in case you don't get it, okay, we'll come back. He sent his son to die and rise again to save us. Ever ending love is faithful and true. He's broken our chains and given us freedom. Yeah. 
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.